Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Patrick Newman. The title of my talk today, as you can see, is The Progressive Era and the Rise of Crony Capitalism. Uh, unlike yesterday's talk, I don't have a funny joke to start off with about the title, so I guess I'll just have to jump right into the economics. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what exactly is this presentation about? Uh, basically, I'll be discussing crony capitalism, or at least one aspect of crony capitalism, uh, in Murray Rothbard's uh, book, The Progressive Era. Uh, which was a newly published book. It was edited uh, by, the, uh, by, by myself, and it contains an unpublished uh, manuscript and an unfinished manuscript that Rothbard wrote. He's planning to write a book on the progressive era, as well as later finished essays. So it really provides a nice uh, chronology from basically the railroad interventions of the 1880s really up to the Great Depression. So if you haven't bought the book, I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, I personally find that it's a great gift for weddings, funerals, Mother's Days, Father's Days, <laughs> birthdays, Christmases, etc. I should preface that at least I think it's a great gift. I don't know how the recipients of the gift feel exactly about, <laughs> about receiving this, but, you know, oh well. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, I will be looking at sort of, you know, the chronology, you know, the story of the J.P. Uh, Morgan uh, and Company uh, ambit, sort of this House of Morgan. Uh, if you remember yesterday, I talked about the House of Cook, this famous investment bank situated in Philadelphia. After the Panic of 1873, the House of Cook fell, and it was replaced by the House of Morgan. And this Morgan name is, we're very familiar with it, um, <clears throat> although it, they sort of lost power by the time of the, uh, the Great Depression, uh, it's still a very important name. You think know, of the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, uh, it's very prominent. Um, <clears throat> And we'll be looking at this investment bank and its various subsidiary financial you know, companies, et cetera, during the Theodore Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson administration. So basically the first 20 years of the 20th century. Uh, in particular, we'll look at sort of some selective antitrust prosecution that they were able to do, uh, as well as sort of briefly talk about their drives for a central bank in World War I. And we'll also sort of go through a general kind of overview of crony capitalism uh, during this uh, era. So, um, no, no. here we go. All right, so why should you care? Uh, so just in general about the book and really just about the progressive era, uh, for most people, the progressive era was very important and beneficial. So the common perception of the 19th century, this was something I alluded to uh, yesterday in my talk on business cycles, was that you had these harmful uh, monopolies, uh, so these large conglomerates, these robber barons that exploited the public. You have these unsafe working conditions, so people were subjected to wage slavery, uh, et cetera. You had these dangerous consumer goods, meat products were adulterated, food products were unsafe. Uh, and so on, crippling deflation, as well as severe business cycles. So basically, people say, oh, these were the ills of the market economy. And yes, they did bring improvements. People's living standards went up. But there were still many problems. And that's why we needed the government uh, to take on a more activist role, which it did in the beginning of the 20th century. So the traditional narrative is that against all of these supposed ills, sort of the masses, the farmers, the populists, etc., uh, and these well-intentioned reformers, you know, the Paul Krugmans, the Ben Bernankes, the Elizabeth Warrens of uh, yesteryear, they sort of rose up, they fought the established interests who sort of resisted these things to, you know, tooth and nail, et cetera, and they instituted these enlightened government reforms that we still have with us today. A central bank, uh, you know, um, uh, an income tax, et cetera. Uh, Rothbard's interpretation is it's not really the progressive era. There wasn't really much progress made. Um, it was actually the regressive era. It was sort of a return to mercantilism. So political entrepreneurs, those entrepreneurs who used the uh, government to, uh, to enhance their own profits, sort of allied themselves with court intellectuals. So those intellectuals who were sort of less interested in truth, but more interested in uh, securing a strong bureaucracy or a strong position where they could sort of plan and tinker with the economy. Because that's what most intellectuals like to do. Uh, as a side point with intellectuals, the market doesn't very, pay very highly for them. Uh, that's why many intellectuals are often interventionists, because they realize they would mostly just be teachers uh, on the free market. Most research grants, et cetera, uh, they're by government or various uh, pro-government agencies. Uh, and this is really the roots of sort of modern government in politics. Uh, 
uh, that, you know, many of these issues that we still have today. Okay, uh, so something that's important to note when we talk about big business in the progressive era, and this is something that Dr. Klein mentioned in his earlier lecture, is that businesses are not often advocates of laissez-faire, so sort of hands-off or kind of this Randian you know, approach where they're, they're, they're pure and they might have you know, these noble intentions, etc. cetera. Um, but they're often, they can be crony capitalists, rent seekers, political entrepreneurs, et cetera. So in general, a market entrepreneur is someone who uh, tries to earn profits by producing goods and services that consumers want. A political entrepreneur, on the other hand, is someone who earns profits by using the government. So trying to use the government's laws to their own advantage or even advocating for such laws. Acquiring subsidies, tariffs, uh, and this the last part is also important, regulations that hurt competitors. So that raise compliance costs on competitors. It makes it harder for them to operate or prohibits, restricts the type of products they can sell or how they can price their products, et cetera. Uh, it's you know one of my most favorite one of my favorite books um, on U.S. history, and this is a book that I read uh, when I just uh, got just get, getting interested in Austrian economics and libertarianism. It was a book by Burton Folsom. It's called The Myth of the Robber Barons. It's a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you read it. And uh, he he really goes through sort of this dichotomy where you have sort of some entrepreneurs who are more market oriented. My favorite chapter is on railroads. He talks about James J. Hill, the Great Northern. And on the other hand, you have those entrepreneurs who will use the government for their own advantage. So uh, the promoters of uh, other various transcontinental railroads. Strictly, it makes more sense to talk about market entrepreneurial actions and political entrepreneurial actions. No one's perfect. Uh, many political entrepreneurs also were engaged in you know, running companies that provided enormous uh, services to the public. Uh, likewise, many you know, advocates of the free market, they just inevitably had to use some government regulation to their advantage. Um, <clears throat> so continuing on with this framework, uh, something that's important to note is that not only when we talk about the legislative arena, we sort of refer to businesses as, okay, they will use the laws of the government to obtain net benefits from. However, there's also sort of another reason why they participate in the political uh, arena, and that's basically to block hostile legislation from other business interests or from other interests, such as bureaucracies or so, you know, socialists, et cetera, that want to weaken these businesses. So uh, one business might support uh, you know, regulation that would you know, get it more favorable dealings with uh, the companies that it sells goods to or it buys inputs from. On the other hand, those companies are going to want to push for laws that will benefit themselves. And in addition, especially large businesses, there's still a particular you know, hostility to large businesses from parts of the public or intellectuals who are always just going to be want, to, want to be trying to push for restrictive legislation, et cetera. So you kind of have to face two threats. This is a great quote from uh, Rothbard from, this, uh, from the book, and this is actually in his World War I, its fulfillment. And he says, big business, he's talking about the progressive era. He says, big business would be able to use the government to cartelize the economy, uh, restrict competition, and regulate production and prices. Uh, and they believe that the big state could thereby provide a middle way between the extremes of sort of this doggy dog laissez faire and the bitter conflicts of proletarian Marxism. So, businesses, on the one hand, they realize that, okay, markets, uh, they hamper us from achieving uh, monopolies. Uh, every business always wants to be the only game in town. On the other hand, uh, we can use the government and sort of block any sort of, you know, this radical Marxist or socialist uh, ideas. There's a great quote in the book uh, from this guy named Ralph Easley, and he was the head of the National Civic Foundation, which was sort of a big business outfit allied themselves with many prominent intellectuals to push for government uh, regulation and intervention on the federal, state, and local level. And he wrote to one of his contemporaries, and he said, our enemies are the, uh, are the socialists among the labor people and the anarchists among the capitalists. So what he means by that is you have these hostile uh, socialists on one hand, and you have not the anarchists in the way we think about it, but those people who would prefer to use the free market, those businesses. Because sort of the catchphrase around this time period became, you know, markets were, you know, chaotic. They, they, they were, you know, it was anarchy. Again, not in the way that we think of it, uh, but in sort of a, a bad way. Um, okay, so sort of continuing on with this, we'll sort of, you know, have a brief, uh, you know, 
we'll, we'll describe the history of antitrust during this period, antitrust legislation. Uh, so in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, beginning with railroads, uh, <clears throat> various big businesses tried to form cartels, mergers, trusts, etc., in an attempt to monopolize markets. So <clears throat> all of these are very similar economically. A cartel is when a group of people, uh, excuse me, a group of uh, you know, firms, they basically informally work together to restrict production and raise prices. A merger is when companies actually legally form together. Uh, a trust is sort of similar to a holding company in which one company basically, you know, a bunch of stock of various companies pooled together and then the, they have a value of the, uh, the, the, the stock of the trust is based off the value of the underlying companies. Um, legally, there's differences, but they're all the same. Uh, without government interventions, I'll sort of talk about, uh, they were generally very unsuccessful. So even with tariffs, which blocked out, uh, you know, which blocked out foreign competition, uh, generally monopolies, cartels, etc., they always on the free market are weakened due to two factors. The first is external pressure, competitors entering in the market, so new firms or existing firms, uh, you know, in a different industry now entering a new industry. We hear about this a lot with Amazon, basically moving in on other companies' turfs, uh, etc. And the second is internal pressure where companies, they might form a cartel, they say, okay, we're going to raise prices, but then they turn around and they, they start cheating, engaging in secret price cuts, etc. So sort of a little prequel to the progressive era related to these large firms is that you have this very famous act, which would be very important in the progressive era, which is the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. And this was sponsored by Senator John Sherman of Ohio. He's the same guy I, I mentioned earlier in the drive for the national banking system. See, everything kind of flows together. Uh, you know, this, the, the, the story among uh, politicians uh, <clears throat> and bankers uh, during this time period. Um, and also many big business Republicans. So why would an act that would ostensibly, it's antitrust, it's anti-large company, why would it be supported by many politicians who there, many of their constituents are large businesses? Well, it basically fits that procedure I uh, described earlier, where one, antitrust was a blunt to Democrats' charges that high tariffs caused the monopolies. There's an old saying back in the day that said the tariff is the mother of all trusts. What that meant is that, you know, large companies, they, they, at least they were able to be somewhat successful if you had a large tariff that prevented external foreign competition. Tariffs back then could be 40 to 50 percent, very high rate. Uh, especially compared to what we have now. Uh, so many Democrats said, hey, you know, one way of getting, you know, blocking these monopolies is just lower tariffs. Republicans didn't want to do that because they were heavily in favor of the tariff. So instead they said, all right, we'll have this law. We won't really enforce it, but we can say, oh, this will break up the, uh, the monopolies. And of course, at the same time, they deny that the tariffs actually caused the monopolies. Um, <clears throat> So as an example, Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in July of 1890, and then the McKinley Tariff, which raised rates from 47% to 50%, it was also supported by John Sherman, uh, was passed in October 1890, so just a couple months later. So it's kind of this awkward, you go, hmm, I wonder what, all right, it's a unique coincidence again. Um, and it was also a blunt to sort of more hostile state antitrust. So antitrust uh, at the state level was supported more by uh, smaller businesses looking to cripple sort of larger businesses that provided uh, benefit from economies of scale to lower prices uh, of goods to consumers. An interesting story, this is something that Rothbard mentioned in his uh, book, and I, I followed this up with a research paper of mine. It's like, was there another motivation for John Sherman? And one of these motivations is actually uh, it allowed him to sort of link his rival, his political rival, Russell Alger, with this notorious diamond match company, or at least emphasize it and put it in the public record. Uh, John Sherman was a politician. He, all his life, he just wanted to get the Republican nomination. He wanted to be president. He's probably one of the most qualified politicians to have never received the presidential nomination, despite repeatedly trying for it. His last shot was in 1888 uh, when he thought he had a chance. Uh, but Russell Alger, basically at the, uh, the convention, siphoned away delegate votes. And uh, John Sherman was convinced this was the reason why he never won. Uh, Benjamin Harrison eventually got the nomination. So Russell Alger later sort of became involved in a legal case involving this uh, diamond match company. And the Senate 
floor when he's giving his speech about antitrust, he repeatedly mentions John Sherman in this little kind of like rinky-dink diamond match company. Like he talks about Standard Oil for two sentences, and then he goes through this huge thing about uh, Russell Alger. So it was kind of like this very, very clear, like skewer, uh, you know, this, this, this revenge sort of. Um, so <clears throat> sort of look at this. At least I, you know, I have these two pictures. You can see him. John Sherman is on the left. Uh, Russell Alger is on the right. Russell Alger is also a, a general. Uh, something that's also funny is John Sherman, uh, his brother was William Tecumseh Sherman, who was the famous Civil War general. And unlike Port John, whose nickname was the Ohio Icicle, he wasn't exactly very charismatic, John Sherman was repeatedly offered the nomination because he was a military general, very successful by the Republicans. And you know, his, his brother William, he always just sort of turned it down. He's like, I, I don't want to be president. You know, I don't want that job. And so he was always very bitter about that too because like, here's something he's trying for and his brother, who, you know, who's not even a politician, was basically given what he spent his whole life trying to get. Uh, so this might come as a surprise, but politicians can be spiteful. I guess that's the, the moral of the story. Uh, I know this is, uh, this is the only case this has ever happened in, uh, and so on. Okay, so sort of which is what predicted by the initial uh, you know, founding of the act is that really for the first 10 years of, it, of its existence in the 1890s, Sherman antitrust was rarely used by any of the presidential administrations. Benjamin Harrison administration, uh, Grover Cleveland administration, and the William McKinley administration. As a funny point, there's sort of an, uh, a story that went on, and Rothbard has this quote that when Benjamin Harrison uh, signed the Antitrust Act, he said, you know, uh, John Sherman has fixed General Alger. So it's kind of like, well, he got him, sort of. You know, he was able to use this whole thing sort of as, as a revenge motive. Uh, at least it was noted by the president somehow, which is kind of funny, I guess, if you, you, know, if you think about it. Um, and during this time period, uh, there's this great merger movement, particularly at the end of the 1890s, from 1897 to about 1901. So mergers uh, reformed were actually companies would literally just try and buy out all of their competitors and keep it under their own uh, company, uh, try to monopolize markets. Okay? Even with high tariffs, 40 to 50 percent, uh, and the lack of federal antitrust enforcement, uh, there were occasionally antitrust cases, uh, but they were almost always decided in favor of the business. If anything, they were it was used to break up unions during this time, so very favorable to large companies. Uh, they still failed due to those processes that we mentioned. Promoters were often over-optimistic about the expected revenue. Uh, so you heard the, a common thing you hear about is something known as stock watering, where the value, the price of the stock people would complain is, is much higher than its underlying value, and this is something businesses were trying to swindle people who bought the stock. No, this is actually due that they were just so optimistic about their monopolies, they thought it would be that profitable. They just made a poor entrepreneurial decision. An example of some of these large companies, uh, you have the Standard Oil Trust, you have the American Sugar Refining Company, uh, the Sugar Trust, so to speak, which kept on reforming in the 1890s, the Beef Trust, Ironically, it was actually never even a trust, which we'll talk about. The National Biscuit Company, uh, as many of us we might still know as Nabisco, uh, yes, they tried to initially form a giant cookie monopoly, uh, <laughs> but they were unsuccessful. You know, that's how the cookie crumbles, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> and then you have other companies like U.S. Steel, which produces steel products, uh, and then International Harvester, which produced agricultural uh, machinery implements. So as a result of this, they weren't really successful, and they would turn to the government to try and help them cartelize. Basically, they now try and support regulation that would restrict uh, smaller competitors or even larger rival competitors, as we'll see uh, and we'll go to. Um, <clears throat> this is a great quote, and this is in the Rothbard book. It's by a contemporary economist, Arthur S. Dewing, on the, quote, trust problem. So he wrote this in 1914. And he did a study, and he showed that, well, many of these mergers, uh, they were only profitable at the beginning. Uh, they were not the leaders in innova you know, innovation. They slowly mo lost market share, market share over time. And he says, I've been impressed throughout by the powerlessness of mere aggregates of capital to hold monopoly. I have been impressed, too, by the tremendous importance of individual innate ability uh, or its lack in determining the success or failure of, of any enterprise. With these observations in mind, one may hazard the belief that whatever trust problem exists will work out its own solution. Okay? 
And uh, he continues here. He says, the doom of the inefficient waits on no legislative re regulation. It is rather delayed thereby. That's an important um, emphasis there. Restrictive regulation will perpetuate the inefficient corporation by furnishing an artificial prop to support natural weakness. It will hamper the efficient by impeding the free play of personal ambition. It's a pretty good quote by a contemporary economist. He basically says that, hey, you know, just buying stuff will not guarantee you a monopoly. It will not guarantee that you will maintain your market share. You have to be an innovator. Even the small guys can win. In fact, the small guys are actually more, uh, they're hungry for the profits. So they're going to often take the leads in per, uh, developing new products, et cetera, that consumers like. You know, this Austrian solution is laissez-faire. The monopolies will get whittled away. You don't need government to uh, step in. It's a great quote. Um, so we move to about 1901, and things change in terms of antitrust, where you have the rise of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who's the, quote, you know, the trust buster, as he's known. Um, you know, I, it's kind of funny, actually, is that his, his successors initiated more antitrust suits than him. He just had a, you know, very high profile, a couple of very high profile antitrust cases, and he would have this very public persona. So it's sort of, you know, stuck in the public's mind to be waging these public battles against the company, you know, these companies, very charismatic, et cetera. So in about September 1901, uh, he was McKinley's, uh, he wasn't his first vice president, he was a later uh, vice president. Um, yeah, McKinley got assassinated in September 1901. So Roosevelt, who Rothbard and I will talk about uh, in this presentation, had many connections to the investment bank J.P. Morgan & Co. Uh, he sort of now unexpectedly becomes president. Uh, back in the day, vice president was kind of like the political graveyard. You know, you were put in the vice presidential spot. It was sort of like, all right, you know, you know away with you kind of. Like after that, it was sort of a dead end. Um, in December 1901, his first annual address, he sort of revives the proposals for the Department of Commerce and Labor uh, and the Bureau of Corporations. Okay? Both of these, the Department of Commerce and Labor, eventually got split into the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor. Uh, and the Bureau of Corporations became the much more familiar Federal Trade Commission uh, that was instituted in, I think, the fall of 1914. Uh, and this, was, this whole move was to instigate this, uh, this compulsory publicity, which is the idea that businesses, government can now inspect the books of businesses. They have to open up the books. Businesses have to comply with reports, et cetera. And this has some cartelizing uh, features. Notably, it weakens restrictive or, excuse me, uh, competitive secret price cutting. And two, it adds compliance costs, particularly among small businesses. Uh, you know, you have to hire more accountants, all the paperwork, et cetera, and it, it, uh, it can clearly uh, reduce your profitability. He sort of clears this with these two Morgan partners. So a partner, you're, you know, you, you have ownership in the investment bank, uh, George Perkins and Robert Bacon. The first one is particularly important. He's sort of Morgan's right-hand man. Now, a lot of people, especially historians, will argue that Roosevelt wasn't really influenced by the Morgan interest because you have this Northern Securities episode. So sort of unexpectedly at the beginning of his administration in February 1902, he unexpectedly launches an antitrust suit against the railroad holding company, basically a trust, Northern Securities, which was just recently established. It was a combination of J.P. Morgan's interest as well as his rival uh, E.H. Harriman, these two giant railroad tycoons. Uh, and, you know, really, though, what Rothbard talks about, as well as the historians he cites, this is kind of a sort of shadow boxing or, you know, people have, you know, Roosevelt did this more for sort of public reasons to sort of show he was hostile against the Morgan interests, even though it didn't really hurt them. J.P. Morgan was no doubtably upset at the beginning, and he visited Roosevelt at the White House and he sort of struck a deal. He sort of got protection for his other companies. Even the suit, which was decided in about March 1904, only the holding company was banned. You know, the railroad ownership was not actually, you know, the railroads were not broken up, and Morgan's ownership of the railroads was actually strengthened. To sort of give you an idea of really how hostile this thing could be to uh, the Morgan company is that the former Secretary of War, you know, back then it wasn't really the Department of Defense, it was called the Department of, you know, War, which you know, I guess is, is a little bit clearer. Um, you have uh, Morgan lawyer Elihu Root, uh, so he, he left the cabinet to defend Morgan uh, in the case, and after, he was later appointed as the Secretary of State. So Roosevelt really couldn't have been that upset with the, you know, with the man 
uh, to say, oh, you know, the Secretary of State position, which is, you know, the most prestigious position in the cabinet, or at least around that time period. Um, so just to sort of, as, as a picture, you have Roosevelt on the left, you have, uh, you have JP, uh, excuse me, you have uh, George Perkins in the middle, and you have JP Morgan on the right. And Perkins was really the connector between the two of them. There's a great uh, book that recently came out, actually, in 2017. Uh, it's called An Unlikely uh, Trust, and it talks about the uh, uh, Morgan-Roosevelt uh, Morgan, uh, relationship. And I, I contacted the author. I was like, oh, hey, you know, this is actually kind of similar to the Progressive Era stuff, in case, in case you're interested. And you know, I sent him a copy and, and, and all that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so it, it goes through a lot of this stuff. This isn't really a conspiracy theory. I mean, this is historians you know, admit this. Uh, you know, those who are willing to sort of uh, look at these relationships. Uh, I personally think, I, I keep bringing this up to people, I personally think that J.P. Morgan was the inspiration behind Wario, so the, uh, the, the, the Mario character. I don't know, uh, so sort of as Mark Thornton is trying to, you know, say, oh, okay, what did Richard Canton look like? I think that, you know, Morgan was the inspiration behind Wario. Evidence here, uh, you have Wario with gold. <laughs> And this is a quote that Morgan, he actually said something different, but it's still a great quote. He said, gold is money, everything else is credit. He's basically like, gold is money, only gold is money, nothing else is. And then there's Wario with gold. I mean, I think it's, I rest my case, uh, to be honest. Um, we got a paper on this somewhere. Uh, no. um, so we go through the, uh, this philosophy of the good, uh, you know, the good trust and the bad trust. Uh, so Roosevelt, uh, who along with, uh, George Perkins had this philosophy that some trusts were good, they were acting in the public interest, other trusts were bad, they were monopolistic, they were exploiting the public, etc. Now, coincidentally, uh, both George Perkins uh, and Roosevelt really thought the good trusts were the Morgan companies, companies like U.S. Steel and International Harvester, some of which George Perkins uh, was very instrumental in setting up. So it's no surprise, like, oh yeah, the, the companies I set up, you know, they're good, you know, everyone else is kind of is bad. The bad trusts were really those companies that were owned by rival financial interests. John D. Rockefeller, uh, the Standard Oil Company, uh, Harriman, who had rival railroads compared to the Morgans, uh, the Beef Trust, uh, et cetera. Uh, so many of these rival financial interests, uh, they were invested in different companies. And if you're able to focus the, you know, the, the assault, you know, antitrust legislation against those companies, you're weakening those financial interests. Sort of the economic theory behind this is, at least in Rothbard and Power and Market, he talks about the difference between an invasive bribe and a defensive bribe. Where an invasive bribe is when someone is bribing a politician to get some sort of special privilege. And this is kind of the case. The Morgans were able to basically uh, almost, you know, in a sense, capture or heavily influence Roosevelt's decisions, where they got a protection for their own companies, but not a protection for their rivals. So they were basically allowed to operate uninhibited while the, the rivals had to uh, deal with, uh, you know, very hostile government. And that's obviously unfair. You know, that, that's an invasive bribe. It's not really so much as a defensive bribe. Uh, to sort of continue with the Bureau of Corporations, uh, the Rockefellers lobby against the Bureau. Uh, and Roosevelt sort of demagogically uses this to get the bill passed in February 1903 because Rockefeller and Standard Oil were very heavily hated and Roosevelt was able to you know, really bring, drive this point home. Again, coincidentally, in the same month, the Elkins Anti-Rebating Act, which was a, uh, an act that restricted railroads uh, from uh, giving price discounts or rebates, sort of pro-Morgan Railroad's anti-shipper, um, you know, that was passed around the same time. Elkins Anti-Rebating Act would also eventually be used against Standard Oil. Standard Oil is, was a shipper. They would, uh, they would transport their goods on railroads. Ironically, also, the Beef Trust was a shipper, uh, the large meat packing companies in Chicago. Um, Roosevelt held sort of these informal detente or these talks with uh, International Harvester U.S. Steel. Whenever the Bureau investigated them, it was, you know, it was sort of very kind. Uh, nothing threatening was done, or Roosevelt sort of blocked anything threatening from them. Um, and in addition, his administration was sort of dominated by people in the Morgan ambit, either as unofficial policy advisors like a George Perkins. Uh, the bill that have actually passed the Bureau of Corporations, Roosevelt gave one of the pens to George Perkins. So, oh, you're very influential in helping me start this. You know, oh, okay, you know, again, that's interesting uh, fact to sort of consider. 
Um, so this was at least the good trust, those trusts who received the favorable, uh, you know, sort of uh, protection from the government. Uh, interestingly enough, despite this U.S. Steel and International Harvest, they were still not successful companies. Why? Because they still had to deal with uh, competition. Um, on the other hand, you have sort of the bad trusts. And this could be uh, an example of this was the Beef Trust. So this is a, co a combination of Armour and Swift. You can actually sometimes still see these names if you go to a deli. They weren't actually even a legal trust. And it's kind of funny is they actually sold the same amount back then the two major food, you know, beef, excuse me, meat products were beef and pork. But I guess the Beef Trust had a better ring than like the Beef and Pork Trust or like the Meat Trust. I don't know. So why was it bad? Well, you know, here's something interesting. Uh, and this is something that some historians have noted. I think it's highly, um, you know, it's important. Roosevelt was a failed South Dakota cattle rancher who had the, you know, ranchers sold their uh, cattle to the beef trust. They constantly complained about them. And he testified against them in the embalmed beef scandal uh, during the Spanish-American War, which was when uh, this general uh, criticized uh, the beef products the uh, company sold to the army. They said they were spoiled and rotten. Testimony actually turned out that, well, it was really the Army's fault because, you know, I guess they, they, you know, they didn't refrigerate the meat or they opened up canned meat and they, let, they just left it hanging out in the sun in Cuba for, like, multiple days. It's like, that will probably make the meat taste bad. And, like, I'm not a chef or, you know, like a scientist, but you know, anyone can kind of tell you that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> ironically, the general, uh, uh, Nelson Miles, uh, Miles, he was married to a, uh, a niece of John Sherman, and the Secretary of War during this time period, which General Miles criticized, was none other than Russell Alger. So again, you know, there's like these like inner family battles that really continue throughout all this uh, politics. Um, so there was antitrust suits initiated them against them in 1902. In 1904, the Bureau, uh, it's one of its first acts, it investigates them. It says, oh, they're a monopolistic company. Um, and in a later research paper, this is something that Rothbard talked about in the book in chapter eight. I sort of continue, I've been working on this with research of my own. Uh, Roosevelt sort of supported these radical socialists, Upton Sinclair, uh, who wrote The Jungle, as well as other uh, progressives to institute sort of these crippling health regulations on meat packers. Uh, but the meat packers, uh, classic regulatory capture in the progressive era, they were, they were able to fight back and secure very beneficial regulation. They got this free inspection free of charge, it's this huge subsidy, and they increased um, uh, compliance costs on their smaller firms. So actually, before the act was passed, the Beef Trust, its market share was constant. It was only around 30% of total cattle slaughtered. But after the Meat Inspection Act, its, it's, it's market share went up. Okay, again, this is the classic compliance costs weakening small companies. And actually, a lot of these health scares, uh, they, they, weren't, you know, they, they, they weren't health scares, the Beef Trust was involved in you know, refrigeration, et cetera, other product innovations that improved meat safety. Uh, another bad trust is sort of E.H. Harriman's railroads. So Harriman was a Morgan rival. There are actually quotes, and Morgan is referring to Harriman as a punk. So he's like, oh, he's this old punk. He's his upstart. You know, he's trying to you know, come on, you know, on my turf. And consequently, Roosevelt was not a huge fan of Harriman. Uh, Harriman donated to Roosevelt's re-election in 1904, but it didn't really help because in 1906, Roosevelt sort of rumors it breaking up some of his railroads. And when one of his attorneys went to see uh, Roosevelt at the White House, Roosevelt just quoted, sort of said, well, you don't know what Morgan and some of these other people say about Harriman. Which is kind of like this odd saying, like, why would this politician be listening you know, to a rival financial interest about how to you know, deal with another financial interest? It's kind of, you see the favoritism. It's sort of a revealing quote. Um, in 1907, Roosevelt played favorites uh, with, Morgan, uh, with Morgan over Harriman. They were both vying for a purchase of a railroad, the Boston and Maine Railroad in the Northeast. And Roosevelt basically let Morgan take it, and he blocked Harriman from being able to purchase it. Uh, so he, you know, he allowed Morgan to, to buy it. No antitrust suit was really seriously initiated. And uh, Har if Harriman done it, uh, you know, purchased it, most likely an antitrust suit would have been initiated. So similar sort of favoritism. Um, the bad trusts, the, the worst, the baddest of the trusts, I guess you could say, uh, the worst of the worst uh, for, for, for Roosevelt was John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil. Why? Because McKinley and Mark Hanna, his sort of his political guru, his, uh, his you know, the, the Karl Rove of, of, of the old days, uh, were both Rockefeller Republicans situated in Ohio, uh, where Standard Oil was initially based. 
and they first resisted Roosevelt's vice presidential nomination. Then the Rockefellers lobbied against Roosevelt's Bureau of Corporations in 1903. They tried to get Mark Hanna to run as a Republican challenging Roosevelt in 1904. Mark Hanna died, so you know, it wasn't really successful. And, and, and then they supported the Democratic candidate, or at least there's evidence they did, in 1904. So it's not the best way to, uh, you know, to try and curry favor with uh, Roosevelt. So Roosevelt sort of vindictively said later, he said, it antagonized me before my election when I was getting through the Bureau of Corporations bill, and then I promptly threw down the gauntlet to it. So I issued the challenge. So they tried to fight me with my Bureau of Corporations bill and, uh, you know, before my election, and now, you know, all right, now I'm going to play, you know, I'm, I'm done playing games. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play rough with them. In 1906, the, uh, the Bureau reported that Standard Oil violated the, anti, the Elkins Anti-Rebating Act. Uh, it was a $29 million fine. It was an enormous fine back then. Now, I wouldn't want to get fined $29, $29 million now. But you think about how large it was back then. It was the largest amount a corporation was ever fined. They were able to successfully repeal it. Uh, but more importantly, Roosevelt in 1907 filed an antitrust suit to break up the company which was successful in 1911, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this is an important aspect that, you know, again, this is, uh, you know, Standard Oil was a company that, per, you know, lowered prices to consumers, it, it increased uh, product innovation, et cetera, but it was always heavily criticized in public, and Roosevelt sort of used this. And there are various personal reasons why Roosevelt didn't, uh, didn't like the company, as we see. The good trust, bad trust dichotomy is really, you know, again, it's kind of personal reasons, you know, whose rival financial interests are you supporting, et cetera. Um, so the Morgans were really able to successfully protect their companies during the Roosevelt administration and secure sort of some favorable uh, government regulation. Um, but sort of there's some trouble brewing kind of in the Taft administration. So Roosevelt steps down after two terms. This was before you had a constitutional amendment. Everyone just sort of followed the tradition of uh, George Washington. And Taft, sort of from Ohio, uh, replaces him. The Morgans were initially optimistic, but Taft and, you know, Rothbard always thought he was sort of closer to the Rockefeller interests. Uh, one of the things he points out, at least some, some of his lectures, is that he, um, uh, Taft, you know, as a Supreme Court justice, appointed uh, someone who later worked for Standard Oil and was also in John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s, you know, Bible study class. And, you know, he thought he's like, no, it's a, it's a Rockefeller counterattack you know, against the Morgan administration. You know, it was a total smash. You know, and he, all right, you know, so you take it for what it's worth. Um, but so he initiated these uh, antitrust suits uh, against U.S. Steel and International Harvester in 1911 and 1912. So the Morgans were obviously upset, uh, and Roosevelt's furious since it's basically a slap at his previous administration. Taft is implicitly saying that Roosevelt did the wrong thing. He protected these companies when he should have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, initiated antitrust uh, suits and, 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 you know, and broken them up. So Roosevelt was sort of induced to run again for a third term. He tries to win the Republican nomination. He's not successful in 1912. And then he runs as an independent for the Progressive Party, this newly created Progressive Party that, what do you know, is headed by George Perkins. So you can kind of see, like, okay, you know, it's sort of a Morgan inducement to get Roosevelt to run again. And the idea was to basically split the Republican vote uh, to make sure Taft didn't win. So in 1912, uh, this was really the last election in, uh, in American politics where there's a third party that actually had some sort of viable uh, influence. Uh, Roosevelt actually got more votes than Taft, uh, but this split uh, and the Republicans basically caused Democrat Woodrow Wilson, who's from New Jersey, to win. Now, Woodrow Wilson, as far as I can tell, uh, as far as I you know, I know it's still true, is he's the only president to be an academic who's an academic, and so he's. I think he was one of the worst presidents of all time, if not the worst. Uh, so this just goes to show that just don't trust any academic. Uh, let, let us a PhD economist, you know, economist who's running for president. Unless it's me. You can trust me, but everyone else, don't, don't trust them. Uh, but you, so academics do not make great politicians, in other words. Um, now, Wilson had many connections sort of to the Morgan uh, sphere, sphere of influence. And really, there's these two major policies uh, that the, uh, you know, were very beneficial to the Morgans during the Wilson administration. The first was finally fulfilling the drive for a central bank, which is something that was really started to be in earnest in, since 1907. Rothbard has spoken about this a lot. Uh, you had the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And this was a huge strength to many New York City banks, uh, those dominated by the Morgans in particular, 
increased their bankers' balances, uh, protected their bankers' balances. Uh, they've been losing reserves to other rival cities. Remember when I was talking about the national banking system before, New York City was the main center of reserves. As time went on, people started to switch to other rival, basically, uh, cities. Chicago and St. Louis became central reserve cities. And in this, initially the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was really the most powerful agency of the, of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Board, or what later became the Board of Governors, was actually almost subordinate to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And who headed the Federal Reserve Bank of New York from 1914 to by 1928 was Benjamin Strong, who coincidentally had many connection, connections to the J.P. Morgan & Co., uh, the House of Morgan uh, Ambit. Uh, another huge, uh, you know, benefit uh, to the Morgans was in terms of foreign policy. So you had World War I, which, uh, you know, started, broke out in Europe in the middle of 1914, ended in 1918. The United States officially intervened on the side of Britain and France in April 1917. They were favorable to them before so, but this is, you know, we officially enter, um, declare a war against Germany, uh, <clears throat> et cetera. And all right, why were the Morgans very enthusiastically in favor of getting uh, sort of uh, pushing Wilson to enter war on the side of, the, um, of Britain and France? Well, the Morgans had a monopoly on selling war munitions, munitions and materials to Britain and France. They had many connections in London, and they were able to secure to them many favorable contracts to their companies like U.S. Steel. And they also had a monopoly on selling uh, their war bonds in the U.S. So kind of like how Jay Cook & Co., had the monopoly on marketing uh, federal bonds to United States citizens. Uh, the, the Morgan uh, banks had a uh, monopoly on selling Brit British and French bonds uh, in the United States. So they clearly have a financial interest in making sure that Britain and France win. Because if not, the value of all these contracts, uh, war bonds, et cetera, is going to go down. Um, so they were, you know, they talk, they go through this a lot, but the Morgans were influential in pushing. Uh, basically, Wilson to declare war on the side of the Allies. Uh, the Morgans were extremely dominant in the 1920s. This is sort of the, the, the their power when they were the most influential, dominant in the uh, in the, the presidential administrations, in the central bank, etc. Uh, they lose power in the second Roosevelt administration. By that I mean the FDR administration, uh, who was really more favorable to sort of rival financial interests like Rockefeller, Harriman, as well as sort of these rival banks uh, getting started, investment banks uh, starting up. Uh, the Morgans were sort of WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. You had many other banks starting up during this time, Italian, Jewish banks, these names would be familiar, Bank of America, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, that were sort of able to gain their power during the Roosevelt administration. Um, this is a great quote, and it's not from uh, Rothbard, it's from Ron Chernow. So just to show you that the stuff really, it's not like sometimes crazy conspiracy theory. Ron Chernow has written many like, authoritative, very these exhaustive biographies of people. He's a very serious scholar. One of his great books uh, on the, it's called the, I believe it's called The House of Morgan, came out in 1990. Rothbard cited it in some of his later essays. Um, he says, the United States emerged from the First World War with thriving industries and a record trade surplus. Sovereign states, city governments, uh, and corporations flocked to Wall Street as they had once courted London's merchant princes. Sunning in post-war glory, the House of Morgan was the world's most influential bank, able to select the most creditworthy customers and a loan capable of handling many huge state loans. That, that, that's important. Um, the House of Morgan spoke to foreign governments as the official voice of the American capital markets. Its influence didn't simply stem from money, but from intangibles, cachet, political connections, and banking alliances. It goes, with the Jewish banks weakened, the Yankee axis of J.P. Morgan, National City Bank, First National Bank, held the keys to the kingdom. Okay, so this is, you know, and this is basically the, the high power over the past 20 years, the Morgans were able to work through the presidential administrations, and at the end of the Wilson administration, uh, they were at their strongest. Um, so at least some of the stuff I consult, the progressive era, some of the stuff on the antitrust was a paper I wrote on John Sherman uh, and revenge. And then uh, the last was a, a working paper on, um, on the meatpacking companies. And uh, you can find all these online for free, uh, also on SSRN. 
Uh, the revenge uh, paper was uh, on uh, the Tom Woods podcast as well. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your attendance.